The reason why the shock was so great, why when one heard the news last night one felt suddenly so empty, was because it was the most unexpected piece of news one could possibly imagine. It was the least likely thing to happen in the whole world. If anyone else had died, Sir Winston Churchill, de Gaulle, Khrushchev, would have been something that somehow we could have understood and even perhaps accepted. But that Kennedy should go, well, we just didn't believe in assassination anymore. Not in the civilized world, anyway. When Kennedy was elected three years ago, it was as if we'd all been given some gigantic, miraculous present. Suddenly, over there in Washington, was this amazing man who seemed so utterly right for the job in every way that we took him completely for granted. Whenever we thought about the world, we had that warm image at the back of our minds of a man who would keep everything on the rails. Now suddenly that present has been taken away from us when we thought we had still five more years before we need to start worrying again. It's funny how people used to talk about Eisenhower as a father figure. Kennedy was far more of a father figure and much more than Ike ever, ever was. One just cannot believe that, well, that rich, happy, talented family could have so much bad luck. Brother Joe's killed in the war, Sister Rosemary born a mental defective, and Sister Kathleen dead in an air crash. When Jack Kennedy visited Europe this year, after his visit to Ireland, he, uh, he came to uh, Britain and he flew to uh, Chatsworth in Derbyshire to visit the uh, grave, uh, his sister's grave. Well, when he got there, there were more than 200 security officers all around this little churchyard. And uh, right next to her was buried, uh, her husband was buried there also, who, was, uh, who died in the war. And there were hundreds of other policemen guarding hundreds of yards of ground in this little churchyard. And about 20 feet away from the grave, um, there was a, uh, a team of medical men uh, with blood plasma just in case anything would happen. Well, it didn't happen in that little churchyard. But uh, in a city like Dallas, thousands of people crowding the streets, it happened. And uh, there wasn't anything that anybody could do about it. When the news came through just before 8 o'clock last night, more than a thousand people all over London caught buses or tube trains, took taxis, drove or walked to the American Embassy in Grosvenor Square. They had to do something. In Berlin, Mayor Willy Brandt asked people to put lighted candles in their darkened windows. Within minutes, they were flickering out all over the city. In Moscow at five past eight, the radio broke into its programs to announce the news. It was followed by solemn organ music. In London, viewers reacted with equal hostility to being treated to a half hour of comedy or being deprived of 20 minutes of soap opera. Well, when Kennedy was picked to be Democratic candidate for the presidency in 1960, Norman Mailer um, wrote a piece about him in a square called Superman Comes to Supermart. At that time, of course, the sort of general opinion was that Kennedy was too perfect, too good to be true. So PRO's ideal American. You get all the sort of film star image, the beautiful wife, the great speeches with easy quotations from Burke and Shakespeare, and the ice cold efficiency, respect for the facts. But there was the homely all American humanity of the man who, when his head went out, went out on his family boating picnics, and his wife was down one end of the boat eating the pate de foie gras, he could be sitting quite happily in the, bow, in the bow, knocking back the peanut butter sandwiches. But once Kennedy was in office, the dream came true. Behind the rocking chair and the cultural evenings of the White House and Caroline's pony and the parties in Bobby's swimming pool, behind the trappings of the image was the first Western politician to make politics a respectable profession for 30 years. To make it once again the highest of the professions and not just a fabric of fraud and sham. When most statesmen die, they have to be explained away with words like integrity and cunning and courage. But Kennedy did not need such apologies, for he was simply and superlatively a man of his age, who understood his age, who put all his own energy and the best brains of his country into solving its problems, and who ended up, in more cases than not, 
by doing the right thing at the right time because he'd gone about it in the right way. Few people would have thought at the beginning of this year that by its end we would have lost the leader of the opposition in Britain, Pope John in Rome and the President of the United States. We have been very aware of death this year. Even here in this studio we have lost someone we still miss. But with the murder of John Kennedy, death has become immediate to people all over the world. For the first time, because of the stature of the man and the nature of a shrinking world, people everywhere feel they've lost someone they'll miss. Yesterday, one man died. Today, in America, 60 lost their lives in a fire. And yet, somehow, it is the one that matters. Even in death, it seems, we're not equal. Death is not the great leveler. Death reveals the eminent. A young man rode with his head held high under the Texas sun and no one guessed that a man so blessed would perish by the gun Lord would perish by the gun A shot rang out like a sudden shout and heaven held its breath for the dreams of a multitude of men rode with him to his death. Lord rode with him to his death. Yes, the heart of the world weighs heavy with the been today one ominous hint of future developments. Already the assassination, which seems at the moment at any rate to have been the action of an individual, is being made subject to the first manipulations of various groups and sections of opinion for their own ends. In America and even here, they have already begun to show their hand. It would be good to hope that the death of a great man will not become a pawn in a power struggle of one sort or another. But it would, alas, be naive. There are two men in the world, for the first time since the world began, in whose hands there lies the possibility of bringing all life on this globe to an end and making its charred remains uninhabitable to the end of time. One of those men looks out on the loneliest view in the world, the view from the White House windows in the middle of our bitter and war-torn century. And yet how little true it is that all power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It would be closer to the truth to say that such power transforms, elevates, even purifies its holder. That the assumption of so terrible a burden 
even as it marks out its bearer as a man forever apart, at the same time gives him the strength to lift it. In what manner this man, whose identity is less important than his office, has come, by degrees, to bear the burden of hundreds of millions who know nothing of him, is no longer important, even if it could be determined. What matters now is that we recognize what we have done. The loneliness of power is a universally accepted truth. There remains the recognition of the loneliness of absolute power, the responsibility for all life and death, a responsibility hitherto reserved only to God. In a sense so terribly real that it transcends paradox, mankind has, by a conscious decision, appointed for itself a God substitute, and the blasphemy of the appointment by men of one man to live and die for us all is rooted in the ultimate blasphemy of the world that it made it necessary. And so, once again, we are reminded that no man is an island, and the bell that tolls in Dallas tolls for us all, not only because of our inextricable interdependence, not only because it shows that although it may be expedient that one man should die for the people, it is neither wise nor just. Not only because it teaches us all that we cannot slough off our responsibilities by putting them all onto one elected scapegoat, but above all because, as the bell tolls, it reminds us in the hideous emphasis it places upon the reality of power, of the frailty of the body in which that power must ultimately rest. And in doing so, prompts us to remember with Montaigne that sit we never so high on a stool, yet sit we but upon our own tails. Amid the echoes of what was, with the exception of the one that killed the Archduke Ferdinand at Sarajevo, the loudest shot the world has ever heard, one bitterly ironic coincidence has gone unnoticed. A few hours before he died, President Kennedy had taken time out of his crowded program to look in on the birthday celebrations in Dallas of John Nance Garner. Garner, who was 95 yesterday, was Roosevelt's first vice president and is by far the senior of the surviving former holders of that office. And when at the 1960 Democrat convention in Los Angeles, Lyndon Johnson, defeated by Kennedy for the presidential nomination, was offered the vice presidency, he hesitated. To help him make up his mind, he telephoned his fellow Texan, Garner, who had held the post all those years before, to ask whether he would advise acceptance. No, said Garner, he would not. And in a typically Texan phrase added, Lyndon, the vice presidency isn't worth a pitcher of warm spit. Nevertheless, Johnson accepted Kennedy's offer and in consequence became yesterday evening the 35th president of the United States. The succession was immediate. In the world of today, neither grief nor shock can be permitted to create an interregnum in the citadels of power. The president is dead. Long live the president. And such is the pace at which the modern world moves, that even before the morning is over, indeed even before it has begun, we must begin to think not of the past but of the future. What then can be read of the future with President Johnson? For the time has long since gone by when the responsibility of the President of the United States was confined to the people of that country alone. I believe that this now global responsibility has fallen into good hands. The contrasts between President Johnson and his predecessor are more obvious than important. Johnson, unlike Kennedy, is not an intellectual, but then neither was Truman. Johnson is provincial where Kennedy was metropolitan, but his years as leader of the Senate gave him a knowledge, understanding and control of the realities of power in politics almost as sophisticated as that of Roosevelt. Johnson, in the inevitable isolation of the vice presidency, had had no direct power to exercise, yet Kennedy, unlike Roosevelt, took his deputy fully into his confidence and shared with him the results of his decisions, if not their making. Johnson's health is suspect. So was Roosevelt's. So was Eisenhower's, and so indeed was Kennedy's own. And President Johnson will bring to the awful responsibility of his office qualities and a record that offer promise that he will be more than merely the best available shadow of the light that failed. Though a southerner, his record on the color question, the rock on which America's future must either be built or sink, is one of the best in the Democrat Party. 
It was he who steered through Congress the only successful civil rights legislation of recent years. And during the 1960 election, he and his wife faced physical violence in their home state for his liberal stand. The other major domestic political achievement of his career, though here too the impossibility of considering its effect only on the United States is apparent, was the planning and execution of the strategy that finally destroyed Senator McCarthy. There is every reason to believe that the assumption of supreme office will only confirm in President Johnson and his policies the beliefs that informed these actions and attitudes. Abroad, he will be chiefly remembered for his dash to Berlin during the crisis of the building of the wall. He was then much criticized for his extrovert behavior. But no part of that criticism came from the Berliners, who correctly saw in his visit a symbol of America's determination to stand firm in the face of any threat to freedom. Nor, on the other hand, is there any reason to fear that the thaw in the frozen attitudes of East-West relations will be seriously endangered, let alone reversed, by President Johnson's accession. His incomparable political shrewdness, the clarity and firmness of the lines which President Kennedy had drawn on the charts of policy into the future, the team of younger men that he has inherited, these will combine to ensure continuity in those aspects of American policy which are of such direct concern to us all. And the ambassadorial mission he undertook for the then fledgling president a few weeks after Kennedy had been elected took him through Western Europe, including Britain, and wherever he went, he made a good impression which will stand him in good stead now. And it's significant that that mission was carried out in the company of so liberal and devotedly internationalist an American figure as Senator Fulbright. Nobody tonight can wish more fervently than President Johnson himself that this dreadful opportunity had not fallen upon him. But since it has, we, citizens of the alliance he now leads, have the right to hope for much from his leadership and the duty to wish him well with all our hearts. I think those hopes and wishes will not be disappointed. A poet once hymned an earlier, narrower moment of crisis in the life of the United States. How much more bitterly relevant are Longfellow's words today. Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging on thy fate. The tragedy of John Kennedy's death is not that the liberal movements of history that he led will cease. It is that their focus may become blurred and that the gathering momentum may be lost. That is the aftermath of Dallas, November 22. It is a time for private thoughts. Good night. Look to